Well, like I said, I want to I want to reiterate here just just for a few moments. I hope from last night, I hope that we have come to agreement and understand that evidently there's a problem with our minds and there's a problem with our flesh that we didn't automatically because excuse me, we became Christians, we did not automatically, bless God, <clears throat> have eliminated the problems that can come to our minds, the problems that, bless God, that can come and attach themselves to our flesh. As I said, the church has struggled for years trying to believe that, bless God, that they no longer could sin now that Christ had became their Savior. And yet at the same time, and as a prophet and being a realist, you know, a realist is somebody where, you know, I, I should have, I should live in Missouri. Show me. You know, I, 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 show me. I see it like it is. You're either healed or you're not healed. Now I do, I do believe strongly, and we're going to talk about sometime probably today about how faith works in all this. You've got to have faith. You gotta believe by faith. You gotta those things that don't even look like they are there. But in reality of, I was going to the one church and bless God, I've been there for, I, I, th I think it was a year. Maybe been longer than that. And bless God, no one had ever been healed in, in the services. And yet it was a Pentecostal church. And yet everybody believed in healing. Oh, we jumped up and down. We shouted. We fell on the floor. When hands was laid on us, uh, it, you know, we did everything right. But nobody was ever healed. I went to the pastor and I said, Pastor, I said, are we lying to the people? Are we, are we lying to them? And he said, oh, God forbid. He said, uh, we, we're not, we're, no. He said, what would you say that? I said, well, you, you said to bring the sick into the services that God would heal them. And I said, I can't tell you how many sick people I brought in. And they went home just as sick and in wheelchairs they did when they came in. Well, he said, uh, now, this is typical answer. Well, <clears throat> it's because your faith, the faith of congregation hasn't come up high enough. Oh, boy, you know, I, I, you know, I was fasting three days a week for that organization, that church. Going without food, carrying, uh, carrying a, uh, uh, you know, uh, a thing of orange juice in my lunch bucket. And I prayed every day, every night I went to prayer and I prayed for that church and the people in it. And I thought, I, and I thought, I've, I've let them down. I've let the, I've, I've let the people, I've let the pastor down. And a few days later, one of the elders of that church came by and said, listen, you need to go with me. I'm, I'm going to Nashville, Tennessee. I'm going down to hear a prophet. I, I didn't know very much about prophets and I said, well, I don't know. No, he said, you need to go because he, he said, Pastor, call me and, and, and you're having a real problem with healing. I said, boy, am I. I, I said, we've, we've never seen anybody healed. I said, we believe it. We jump up and shout. We fall down. We do the Jericho march around the building. Nobody's healed. I went to Nashville with him. And that was one of the first times that I was ever drawn out of a great big crowd in front of somewhere around 5,000 people, and I was prophesied over as to being a prophet. But I saw God do miracles. This old man was preaching. And when he began to preach, I'm going to tell you what, the glory of God fell upon the people in the congregation. And miracles began to rot themselves. And I left there and came back here to this part of the country, and I at least knew one thing. God was still on the throne. God was still working miracles. But you see, point in fact here, that we get so caught up into church, into religion, that sometimes we don't weigh it all out, and sometimes we don't really, really ask ourselves the right questions. We live in hope. We lived in hope that somebody would be healed. I didn't stay in that church very long. After that, in fact, it probably went two or three months and I was gone. And I finally told the pastor, I said, if this is all there is, I quit. A lot of you sitting here this morning have said the same things to yourselves or to somebody else. 
If that's all there is to church, what I have today, it isn't enough. Because it does not, in any way, shape, or form, act, look like, or is the book of Acts. And brothers and sisters, there is going to be a power move of the Holy Ghost through the remnant. Who are the remnant? The Ephraimites. That is going to turn this world once again upside down. Say, I can. Amen. Say, I will. I will. The, devil the, the devil doesn't have the power. I've been given the anointing by God. And that's all there is to it, isn't it? That's the end of the matter. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Ephesians 4. Well, you know, when God does something, he does it perfectly. One of many things that we love about him, amen? Ephesians 4.22. It says that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful us. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now notice what, uh, it, before this he's talking about put off the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the, the deceitful lusts. Then he turns around and he gives us our first indicator, and he says you must be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now most of us, if, if, if you have any type of uh, uh, theological training, Bible study, you realize the blessed God that we have been given the mind of Christ. That's, a, that, that's absolute scriptural. The problem is, if we've been given his mind, then is he, did he think of all the trash that we think about? No, because he sinned not. Was he tempted? In all ways, as we were tempted. Yet he sinned not, saith the scriptures. So we're being told here, bless God, that it is the renewing, it is the renewing of the mind. It's it, it, in the, in the, in the, renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now the attachment and the way that the Satan always comes to us is through suggesting. We're going to get to this in just a minute. He begins by getting you to Listen to a suggestion that he has. Now, if your mind has been renewed in the spirit, and how does it get renewed? By the word of God. If your mind has been renewed in the spirit, then your mind is going to say, uh-uh. The thing that I teach when I get into these things is you've got to be quick. You don't want to linger. You have to be quick to bless God, deny, to deny any planting of wrong things into your mind. Because everything that gets planted does what? It grows. Everything does. So everything that you hear every day, if in fact it's right things or it's wrong things, sooner or later you're going to have a harvest. And we're going to talk about the harvest time here too today. He goes on to say, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, so we are created, the new man is in righteousness and true holiness. Now what's he saying? There is not, bless God, any more of what he's about to say in 25, wherefore putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye anger and sin not. Let, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now listen to 27, neither give place to the devil. Neither give place to the devil. He's saying stop these things. Stop all this stuff that's going on. Don't be given place to the devil. What does he mean by that statement? When Paul began to deal with this, and we talked last night about how Paul was saying, you know, there's not any good thing in my flesh here. The things I want to do, I find I'm doing the, the evil things that, that I'm, I'm literally thinking about. And now he's saying, neither give place to Satan. Evidently, Paul knew something, and he did. That Satan, bless God, and his cohorts, which I think I said are the same spirits that were here always on this earth. They were here during the, at the time of the flood of Noah. They, the spirit can't be drowned, okay? 
Bless God, they will be chained and thrown into the, into the you know, the, to the, I call it the holy fire of God, the lake of fire. But the, but the, the thing of it is, Paul said, don't give place to him. And what, how is he doing? Well, you refer back to what, what he said through the renewing of the spirit of your mind. So he's saying, if you don't let your mind dwell on it, you will not have given place to him. Now listen. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing that, 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 that which is good, that he may have to, to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceedeth out of your mouth, but that which is good in the, in the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. But evidently your mind's not sealed to the day, and nor your body. And that's where I was taken and we, uh, laying the foundations that we could go to today. But he, he is saying, no, don't grieve the Holy, don't grieve the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God. How do you grieve him? When you get placed to the devil and, and, and the, and powers of darkness begin to come in, suggest and you begin to, oh, well, yeah, why not? Nobody else is looking, are they? Then you have given place to the devil and, and then you have fallen into a trap. You've fallen into a satanic trap. Because now you've grieved the Holy Ghost. Now listen, now listen how important this is. Once you grieve the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Rahakadish, then when you pray, and does he not lead us, guide us, and teach us into all truth? If you have grieved him, my brothers and sisters, now listen, you cannot hear him now. You can't hear, you have grieved him. You have broken his heart. Because he is there to, to guide you, to teach you, all of us, into what? All truth. The basic fundamentals of Christianity, I call Christianity 101, the church never taught. The church has been too busy building their own kingdoms, trying to gather numbers so they could do so, and you have to have lived it to, be, to have been able to have taught it in the first place. And that's where the first of the downfall came. If anyone did know anything about it, it wasn't enough to spit on us, I'm always saying. Let's go on. Now, in the 31st verse, he says, Let all bitterness, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Let all bitterness. We're going to talk about that sometime in one of these sessions. But just a little prerequisite here. Bitterness is a killer. Bitterness will bring arthritis to your bodies. I've seen too many cases of it. I've seen too many people that I, I have watched God deliver from bitterness get back with me in three or four or five or six months later and say, I, I, you know, something funny happened. No, there's no arthritis anymore. Bitterness will cause arthritis to come. Some of you in this room, you have been bitter all your life. And you take the bitterness out on anybody, bless God, that'll <laughs> lay down and roll over for you. Maybe that bitterness came when you were a little kid in school. Maybe it came when something happened when you, when you were a child at home. Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher that said or did something. But some of you here today need to be delivered of bitterness. You need to understand those are the things that bless God that will do what? They will grieve the Holy Ghost. They will grieve the Holy Why? Because that's not of the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. And be kind one to another. <laughs> you know, I'm always telling people, let's don't lie to each other. Let's don't try to say, oh, I love you. I said, let's just try to like each other. Who knows? We might mess around and fall in love here. Tender hearted, forgiving one another. Some of you here today have a spirit of unforgiveness. You've harbored it for years. You just flat cannot forgive some situation that went on for years. The lady came, was a pastor's wife, and she came here on a, we were having Sunday night, regular church service type of thing, and come time for the healing line, she came to the healing line, and, and so I, I began to minister, the laying on of hands, and I came to her and I started to lay my hands on her, and God said, don't touch her. He said, you tell her 
to go ask forgiveness from her sister-in-law because she has a spirit of unforgiveness and she has a spirit of bitterness. Well, anyway, uh, it made her mad. She said, well, I'm a, I'm a pastor's wife. Well, what does that mean? whoop de doo That gives you a special badge to have unforgiveness? Huh? Well, it's all right for me to have unforgiveness because I'm the pastor's wife. He had sent her there, Pentecostal church. He had sent her here because a friend of his, a fellow pastor, had told him about the anointing that God has put into my ministry in my life. And she said, I came to be healed. I said, well, honey, you, you're already healed. And all you got to do is go beg for forgiveness from your sister-in-law. She stomped out of the room. I'm not sure how many months went by, but one night I looked and she was sitting way back over in this corner. When I got finished, she stood up and she said, Prophet. I said, yeah. She said, can I say something? I said, go right ahead, darling. She said, I was mad when I left here. And I said, oh, nobody knew it. She was stomping holes in that concrete as she went out that door. She said, well, she said, I may went home, told my husband, and she said it made him mad, and, and, and I think, it, I think it, it, it went that he was even considering trying to call me and to give me the what fours. Never did. And, and, and she said, and she said, I got on my, my death bed. Now listen, folks, spirit of darkness will drive you absolutely drive you. I got on my deathbed and, and the family was told that I only had just a short time to live. And she said, all of a sudden, I thought to myself, here's a spirit of pride. Well, he couldn't have been right about my sister-in-law. Then all of a sudden she thought, I'm dying, what have I got to lose? What if he is right? So she called her sister-in-law, which she hadn't spoken to in years, to come to her deathbed. And her sister-in-law came. And she begged her to forgive her. And, of course, the sister-in-law forgave her. In three days, God raised her up off that deathbed. No more cancer. It was all gone. Listen, my children. Listen, my children, to the power of the secrets of the kingdom. Because they're there. They're there. Bitterness. Unforgiveness. They're killers. But darkness is what? John 10.10? 10, out to steal, to kill, and destroy. That is their primary goal on this faith. You see, we get to thinking because we're Christians that the, the devil doesn't have anything now to do with us. No, 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 no. He's more concerned about your life now than he's ever been. Why? Because you see, he knows the word of God too. He knows that if you give him place, he has place. And he knows that when he has place, because you've, you've given it to him. He didn't come and just say, boo, I'm coming in. No, no. You gave him the place. He took the place. And now look at your life. Well, it's not my, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. I don't, I, it's not me that has the unforgiveness. It's their fault. You, you know how to take care of those things. Just go say you're sorry. Whether you think it's your fault or it's not your fault, just go say, I'm sorry, forgive me. And you will be surprised what will happen. That will deliver you and that also will deliver them. But see, somebody, Somebody has to take that step. Now, some of you in this room, maybe quite a few of you, are old enough to, to, to remember uh, the, the, the TV thing called Happy Days. And old Fonzie could never say, I'm sorry. And some of us are like that. Some of us cannot say, I'm sorry, forgive me. Because if you understand what Paul was writing here, he said, he said, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. He said, just do, just do these things that you can walk in freedom. Let me tell you something. To walk in peace, 
to walk in peace, you can't have unforgiveness in you. Unforgiveness won't let peace come forth. It won't. Now, evil spirits do possess people, even children of God, if they let them. And again, do you give place? You give place, and guess what? The next, the next thing, it's over. First Thessalonians 5.22. Now, it's just this one scripture. I'm sure you've heard it. You can turn there if you like, and you can look at it. But it says, abstain from all appearances of evil. That was the thing I kept using about, about Halloween with people. Well, now it doesn't hurt anything. We, we don't believe in the devil. But abstain from all appearances. I said, doesn't that look to be evil? Those black witches, the black cats, this old witch riding around on a broomstick. Doesn't that, doesn't that somehow look evil? Of course it does. Abstain from all appearances of evil. Does all matter of, of talking one against another, is that evil? Yep, that's evil. Is somebody that, that, that so discord, is that evil? Yep, that's evil. Judgmental? Absolutely. Judgmental. Now folks, I hope you're beginning to get the idea if you're participating in these, and yes we are, then it is one of the keys to God's kingdom. I, I, I told you, what, three, three and a half years ago that I would be giving you a number of keys to the kingdom as we walk through this thing. All this, uh, for you folks that are here today, uh, you're, uh, this weekend, for the first time, you're going to get something out of it, and praise God you are, but for those of you that have been here through the past three and a half years, this is a continuation from what God demanded that we learn here, to go there, to get here, to get here, to get there, to go over here, to get over here, to be there, to go down here, to prepare to go there. And that's what it is. This isn't an old golly gee what popped into this prophet's mind. No, after fasting and praying, this is what God said, now you do this. Just as we went through the things that we have gone through, just as we have delivered those things as God's told us to deliver, because we are at this point, we are at this point with this organization coming to the place from what we have planted through the word of God to get you to understand God will tolerate nothing but holiness. He will tolerate nothing but holiness. Anything outside of holiness turns God off. The reason your prayers aren't answered is because, bless God, you're living in sin. And you keep repeating that sin. You can't seem to walk away from that sin. And that's what we're here this weekend about, to help you begin to understand how that you can do this. 2 Timothy 1.7. 2 Timothy 1.7. He says here, he says, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I love the way he put that together. Because he said, it isn't fear. He said, a spirit of fear. Notice that how, again, what is it? It's a spirit. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. So, so this thing, you know, on one occasion, I was asked to come to a mental institution here in southern Illinois. And a family had had a loved one that had had a history of mental problems. Now, is that, is that spirit or is that flesh? Spirit. And one of the members of the family came into a service, and it just happened to be the service where this gentleman came, stood right here in the middle of this aisle, and I got to him, and the first thing he did was spit blood all over a brand new white shirt of mine. Now, that's a no-no. The next thing that he did was levitate off of the floor right there. Laid right out across parallel to the floor. Right in front, about this high. As I said, I use these things for teaching tools. The spirit world has always amazed me. Still does today. Here's this guy floating. We got no, we got no things hanging from the ceiling. Anything propping him up from underneath. You know, I want to take a ring and... <laughs> And in the end, I, as I think last night, I just put my finger and come out in the name of Yeshua to bang on the floor he went. Now, one of those, uh, one of those, uh, family members happened to be here. By the way, I lost a, a whole row, first two rows of a church that had, 
had come to me the week before and said that they, they had closed up their little country church. And now, I love this Southern Illinois slang. Prophet, we've come to throw in with you. <laughs> well, I've been thrown up on, okay? <laughs> so they all came and they had a van and they were just talking about how they were going to put the name of the church on the van and here they come. They were all sitting right here. Now, folks, now these are Pentecostal people, but after that happened, they left out of here like somebody had yelled fire. I said, well, where, where, brother such and such? He said, I don't know, but a cloud of dust, and he went out the parking lot back on the highway. They never came back. It scared the turkey out of them, okay? The people that should believe the most are the people that don't believe at all, okay? So the back to the guy, okay, in this same asylum. So he tells the family members, and so they contact me, and they, they said to me, would you go down to this institute? Would you go in and pray for, uh, pray for their daughter? I said, yeah, I'll go. I'll go. So I went, I, I went down with one of them. I met them somewhere over here in Southern Illinois and got in the car. They took me down there. They, uh, took me into the place and they were going, they, 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 they had her in a padded room where she couldn't hurt herself. The floor was even padded. And so they wanted me to stand outside the door and pray. I looked at that guy and I said, no, I'm not going to, I want, I want in there. I said, oh, no, no, you can't, you can't go in there. I said, yeah, I, I, I want to go in there. I said, I want to lay hands on that, on that girl. Well, you, you, you'd have to sign some papers. I said, get them. Boy, they brought a handful of papers and I signed them. That old boy took the key out of his pocket and he said, now, you don't know what you're in for. I said, oh yeah, I do. <laughs> I rolled under those pews, remember? <laughs> I knew exactly what I was about to get into. So he opened the door. I walked in. He quickly shut it. I hear it lock. <laughs> and you could see in this little gal's eyes, you could see evil. She said, I'm going to kill you. I said, oh, no, you're not. No. But I said, I want to tell you something, Satan. I've come to cast you out of this body. I've come to command it in the name of the Holy One of Israel. And about that time, she came at me with claws extended. And before she got to me, I screamed, Devil, come out! In Yeshua's name. She backed up. What'd you say? What'd you say to me? I said, come out, you stinking demon, in Yeshua's name. She backed up and got in the corner. She began to tremble. She began to shake. I walked over and got my hands laid on her, and and uh, seven or eight spirits came out. Now, folks, I get to see these spirits come out. This this isn't. I think that one come out. Real deliverance preachers see over into the other side. Okay, you 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 get you, you that's goes with the package. That's the reason I say there's some of this stuff you've got to leave alone. But you've got to learn what you can do. Most of which I'm going to teach you, you can do. Okay? But there's some of this stuff you want to leave alone. Uh, in about, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight minutes, she sat there calm as she could be. She said, can I go home now? I said, well, I, I said, I, I don't know what the procedure is, darling, but I said, Come on, I took her by the hand. Now, I didn't realize, of course, I, with all the screaming going on, between me and her, this old boy's out there looking through that. <laughs> and, and he sees me with my hand in her hand. And he looks at that, and I said, Could, will you open up the door? He said, I, I don't think I can. I said, yeah, just take the key, you turn it that way. Open the door. And so he did. And he's backing up the whole time we walked out in that hall. He said, what happened in there? She cast the demons out of her. She's crazy. I said, does she look crazy? Is she acting crazy now? 
You put her in a trance. I said, no, this living God delivered her. Set her free. And bless God, I'm going to tell you something. She got in that car and left that asylum that night with me and her father. That is what true deliverance is about. But it can't, it, it, it can't operate. And, and, and folks, I, I wish that, that I could somehow convey to you, because people get to believe in people like me, just walk on water, and we just, you know, with all this, I have to live by faith just like you live by faith. The difference is, from the foundations of the world, I was given the anointing like that unto Elijah. And it's always been there. Like I said, I've been having these having these visions since I was eight years old. This isn't something that just came in my life after I got saved and got the Holy Ghost and ooh, I feel it, you know. No, no. Like I, it, it's been it's been a curse to me. But it had also, on the other hand, it's been a blessing to multitudes of people, and I know that. I I know that that, that without you see the problem. And, and I know Kent Brockman's here, and he's a psychiatrist and a good one. Number one, because he's saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, okay? Yeah. You've got family in his neck of the woods that needs counsel. You get them to him, because he'll do it right. But there is a place and a time when this has to get away from the talk and the reasoning, and it's just flat got to get down to what? Casting out devils. There has always been. Jesus... Yeshua was a devil caster outer. Okay? We read about how that, and I loved it being a, uh, as I said, I think last night, being a, being a Jew, I loved it that the, he cast those demons into the, into the, into the pigs. You know? <laughs> they ran off the, the, the cliff into the ocean. You know? I'm going, <laughs> there weren't that bunch of hogs. That's a Jew for you, though. So God has an understanding. The thing you've got to understand that Satan has to first work from the outside in. He has to work from the outside in. The second thing I want you to make sure that you write down this morning, your mind is the door to your spirit. Your mind is the door to your spirit. Your mind will dictate, will dictate to your spirit man. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians the tenth chapter. Again, most of these scriptures I'm sure you've heard. I don't hear think you've probably heard them correctly altogether, but Second Corinthians ten, three through five. For though we walk in the flesh, we do no war after the flesh. Now I think uh, I think Paul went at this one other time that we've read about. In fact he did. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not flesh and blood. The weapons Wait a minute, you mean there's weapons? Yeah, the weapons of our warfare. Is this a war? You bet. You know what it's a war for? It's a war for your very soul. Again, just because you become saved doesn't mean that, bless God, the devil, because you know why the, you know why the devil has to stop you? Because when you find out that this thing with the Lord God is the truth, you're going to tell somebody else because we all got big mouths then they're in turn going to find out, and before you know it, you're going to have a whole town, a whole city, a whole county. And so the powers of darkness have to stop you. See, I've told, I've told the, the guys uh, within the, the, the ministry here of this organization that Satan has to stop this, and I began to talk about this, what, uh, maybe two years ago, because I said if he can't stop this and we get to a certain place, I said it'll be unstoppable. Our place is not to look at the circumstances, but listen, to look at the promises. We have to constantly, we have to constantly keep our eyes upon the promises of God. And his promises are yea, yea. There isn't anything that God will hold back from his children. The problem with God's children is, most of us are ignorant unto God's devices. Most of us think that, well, I'm a Christian and I can pray. I, most of you heard me tell the story about how it was I, with the first church I was in and everybody got up and said, God said this and God said that and, and I was so excited and then I was so disappointed because I didn't ever hear God say anything to me. Remember, I'm a realist. 
So one Sunday, I said to the pastor, one Sunday morning, I said, you know, everybody's saying God said this stuff. I said, I don't ever hear from God. He said, oh, Brother Deckard. He said, you just, you, you don't understand. He said, when you go home, after you have lunch, he said, go in the, go wherever you pray and, and shut the door and just pray, get quiet. The first thing that you hear is going to be God. And of course, most of you in this room know the rest of the story. Went back to church that evening. He said, well, Brother Deckard, did, uh, did you do what I told you? I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, what did God say to you, Brother Deckard? I said, go get a hamburger. <laughs> you must have been a tough one to break, Brother Deckard. Oh, I was like a thoroughbred tough to break, Brother Deckard. It didn't come easy, believe you me. But you see, God is there for us. But we monkey so many things up that God can't do anything for us. Then, then we keep pretending. See, that's where that realist part in me comes in. It either is going to happen or it's not going to happen. Yes, there's a time that you've got to stand. There's a time that, bless God, that, that, that you don't want to faint and stand with the things and the promises of God until they manifest themselves. But you know, folks, after three, four, five, ten years, let's come on, let's look back into that mirror that I'm asking you to look in that's of your own self. You need to look in there and say, something's wrong, self, because something is wrong, self. And that thing that's wrong isn't God's fault. Now listen, and it's not even the devil's fault. Because somewhere along the line, through the lack of good, strong, Holy Ghost-based teaching, you either didn't get taught, or you refused to receive what you were taught. One or two things. Because the fact of it is, God, and we talked about it last night, through his son Yeshua, and what did Yeshua say? I put Satan under your feet. Amen. Well, now, if he's under your feet, then he sure as the world isn't anywhere in a mind or a body, is he? So if he did that, preadventure he lied to us. God forbid. God can't lie. Amen. And see, and so often you hear me, hear me come at this like this. But folks, something's wrong. If, if, if God put Satan under our feet and gave us the renewing of our mind like unto his holy son, Yeshua, then there is nothing, according to scripture, by many, any means can harm us. And yet at the same time, we have learned to condone what I tell you, the two biggest corporates in the church that you're going to have the biggest problem getting over and through to go on with God would going to be a judgmental spirit and a, a spirit of discord. Those are going to be the two hardest things being around this prophet that you were going to have to overcome. Now, brothers and sisters, there comes a time with, with prophets when God says drop the hammer, there's only one thing that I can do is drop the hammer. Some of you in this room that's been with me for a while, you ain't listened. You're still so in discord. You're still judging. Some of you people sitting out here, and I'm going to tell you right now by the Spirit of God, you better go to the leadership, and you better beg them of your fellowship to forgive you for your judgmental spirit. You hear that pin drop on that rug? I'm right. Don't, again, don't push me. Don't, don't you push me and, 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 and make me have to come to you in one of these services and ask you to stand up so the whole congregation you can hear at the same time. Listen to me, folks. I know where you're at. I know what you do behind the closed doors. Don't push me. Do you remember the story I, I tell? I love the story about the man. Came down front, and I prayed for him, went across here, and he's still standing there. I got back up there, and I said, what, what are you doing? Well, he said, I'm not going to go sit down until I get what I came from, from God. I'm staying right here. He said, I want a word from God. I said, oh, I'll give you a word from God. His wife was sitting back right over in here. I said, is that your wife that's got the brunette hair? Yeah. I said, who's the blonde you're sleeping with? Well... Now, he stomped out, not down this aisle, but down that aisle. Grabbed her, out the door he went and left. 
And as the story goes, a few weeks later, she shows up, and I don't know which side, I think it was over here, and she stood up and she said, uh, Prophet, can I say something after I got done? I said, yeah, I'll go ahead. She said, I found the blonde. Don't, 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 don't try this out. This, it won't work very well with you or for you. That's a, that's a reason it, it just, I, 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 I have to do everything I can do to control myself. To hear some of you people come to me and try to make yourself out as some spiritual giant. I'm looking at your heart, and I'm going, yeah, with that there, yeah, you can bet God showed you that. You can bet you had a dream with that in your heart. It's called a broken and a contrite spirit, brothers and sisters. Until that arrives, don't worry about the other, because if it comes, and I've taught you already what? Familiar spirits. Most of the people that are hearing something from the, from the supernatural realm because of the fact that they haven't got their lives cleaned up, they haven't been delivered, is receiving from familiar spirits, spirits of darkness. They don't know it. Why? Because they come as an angel of light. They come like God himself. Now, the tenth of a, a chapter of Second Corinthians, he said, that, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, what are those strongholds? Those strongholds, brothers and sisters, are those things that are keeping us, you and I, individually, from the blessings of God, from the promises of God. That's what these strongholds are all about. But he says now, now he says uh, that they're not, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. Notice that's number one. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every, you need to circle that, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now that should be the doctrine in which we live by. We should understand that, that God requires us to cast down first ever imagination. What does that mean? Well, some of you that's got a little bit of problem with uh, pornography. I'm looking at some woman and, hmm, that's an imagination. Where'd that come from? It comes here. It comes from some of you thinking, well, you know, uh, well, I don't think as much of her as, uh, as uh, being one sister to another sister. Where did the imagination for that come from? From God? Did, 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 does all this come from God? Does the pornography, does, does all this, all this junk that's going on here in this room? Is that from God? No, it's not from God. Well, it's a, just a weakness in my flesh. You bet it's a weakness in your flesh. It is stealing from you the things of God and you don't even know it. And I've had people for years say, well, I just thought eventually God would deliver me from that. That's a joke. No, you are going to deliver yourself from that. No, you didn't get a paper bag when you came in so you could spit your demon in it before you left. What a joke that was. No, this prophet isn't going to instantly deliver you this weekend so you can go home and everything's okay. No, that's not going to happen. You are going to learn this weekend how to deliver yourselves. And when it comes to the things you can't deliver, you're going to wish you had, because that's when you and the prophet's going to have to sit down. And that isn't going to be any fun. But that, again, is your choice. Well, I just can't help myself. I, I, I You know, prophet, I, I, you know, I've tried. I've, I've got fasted. I've prayed. Then keep fasting and praying. But the first thing you're going to have to do is tear down those imaginations that exalted them, himself against the things of this Most High God. You're going to tear them down. How do you tear them down? When it comes, I, I'm going to, I want to use me. Folks, everything that I'm teaching you, now listen to me, I have had to walk through. It didn't happen to me overnight. I'm letting some of you, or God's letting some of you, have a shortcut in this thing because you're going to come out of this thing a whole lot quicker than I had to walk step by step. And those were little bitty baby steps too. They weren't the great big mother of May eyes, okay? 
They were the little bitty ones. But I found out the slickest way to do it. Now, when it came to the thing of the imaginations, all right, I found out, and we're going to get into some word here in a minute, but I found out the best thing you could do when it come on. Okay, I'm going down, I, I, I'm, I'm going down a, maybe an aisle in a, in a store. And all of a sudden, some imagination of, well, so, you know, old Charlie, he, he did me wrong out there in that, out there at the job. Shut up! Shut up, devil! I rebuke you right now in the name of the Yeshua! Shut up! I won't receive that! Get out of here! Now, folks, if you can imagine being in the aisle next to put somebody doing that, and it became, old oh, Crazy Deckard is in town again. But you want to know something? It worked. Because why? I was tearing it up, I was tearing it down, and I was making sure that it didn't get into my mind and get planted or my heart. And so I, I, I would I would verbally I would verbally take that on. Now before that, bless God, another area that I had to work on was bless God of speaking the things of God out of my mouth. You know how I took care of that? Didn't have it, didn't have a beer. I used duct tape. Yeah, went one 24-hour period. My life having to be around people, of course. And that you think these hats make you feel funny? Try putting duct tape across your mouth. That's funny. People will look. What? what what's that about? Why don't you take it off? But I went 24 hours, and I didn't speak one thing contrary to the Word of God. I've always told people, I said, when I get to heaven, it may be that that's the only day that I had that I made 24 hours, but at least I made one. Folks, you have to train yourselves. This doesn't come with a package of salvation, nor the infillment of the Rahakadish, the Holy Ghost. That's the reason I said, unless you are willing to make your walk, your life, 24-7, you ain't going to make it. Not, not in this, you're not going to make it. You're going to have to understand to be used. You're going to have to be a clean vessel. The only way to become clean vessels is to understand that there are some... That first off, you've got to understand you've got a problem. Now, hopefully, at this juncture of the weekend, those of you that came in and last night when I started was sure you didn't have one, I hope that there's just a little bit of crack has come into your noggins of sin. Well, yeah, you know, maybe I those imagination things. Yeah. Oh, there's more. We'll get to it. You have to tear down the imaginations. You've got to, and, and again, the, uh, uh, you. I don't doubt you can't do it another way. For me, it just worked easier. Ah, uh-uh, no, 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 devil! I'm not going to receive that. Get out of here in Yeshua's name. What does that do? It freed me up. Now, folks, you do that enough, and you know what? Satan knows, and I don't know a big percentage of Christianity, that he's got the upper hand. Not because it was given to him by God, but because we gave it to him. And he knows that. But when darkness, bless God, finds out that somebody has the gall to take the name of Yahweh's Holy Son, Yeshua, and begin to use that, they get real nervous. They get very, very nervous. Why? They know the truth. They know that they can't stay connected to the body or the mind of a Christian when he gets educated. What it is, it's the lack of knowledge that destroys us. Knowledge will set you free. The lack of it. The Bible says it's the lack of knowledge. And like I said, I've been to deliverance uh, services when I was young, every time there was one in, within 200 miles, somehow I'd find my way there. And I, and I, I, after I began to receive truths and begin to realize what a fallacy this was. Now, I'm going to give you the worst one. I did, I did not go to this. Now I'm going to repeat this. Is everybody listening? Say amen. amen. Great. I did not attend what I'm about to talk about saying that. This friend of mine comes to me and he says, you know, Brother Decker, in Decatur, which is about a four-hour drive from here, there's a, a national deliverance preacher that's coming in there. They're going to have a big meeting. And he said, let's go. I said, well, I can't. 
Now, and I couldn't. I had something going on, or probably I would have maybe. But something didn't seem right. And I didn't know enough about what my spirit was doing to, to know whether it was or wasn't God. But anyway, I didn't go. So a week or so went by, and, I, and he never called me. And anyway, I ran into him there in Mount Carmel, and I said, hey. I said, brother, I said, I've been waiting on your phone call. I said, how did that service go? He said, step over here, brother. I said, well, well, what happened? He said, well, everything went pretty good. He said, it sounded pretty good, and everything seemed to be pretty good. And he said, then we were going to break at lunch. And he said that the, the, the preacher said for everybody to go down to the local pharmacy somewhere and get a, a, a kit to take an enema. First clue. Now, this is the way they were going to get the devils out of them. And folks, if I was to mention this guy's name, most of you, if not all of you in this room, would know exactly who I'm talking about. Now, I mean, I'm snickering, okay? No, I'm downright laughing. I said, and? <laughs> Meaning that, what did you and your wife do? So we left. He said, we left and came home immediately. He said, now, Brother Deckard, we did not go to the pharmacy. Folks, it's been crazy. It is absolutely, been, and it still is today. I was around an old boy one time. Dear God in heaven, I don't know. I wasn't very old. I I just gotten into ministry though, and this he was a probably sixty five, an old man. Be careful now. And his big deal, everybody had a spirit of Cochise, the the Indian chief. Everybody did. I'm going, dear God in heaven. Was that right? No, it wasn't even close. Wasn't even close. But I have known for years and years and years what the problem really is. The problem is, is the same with this that it is with the rest of the things of, of God's kingdom here on this earth. The prophets were locked out. The only people that really absolutely without a shadow of turning can discern into these areas are real prophets. Now, there are different degrees that I've taught you about of, of the anointing. There's different places within the anointing. That, that's the reason the whole body fitly has to come together. Uh, not No one is all anointed. Uh, Messiah, Yeshua was the only one that ever was. That's And the reasoning behind that, as I've always said, was so that we would all have to participate one with another. And when preachers get this jealousy thing, which is a spirit, out of the way enough where they can bring people in that will complement their anointing and let their anointings operate along with the anointing that they have, fill the gaps that theirs won't cover, you would see something get to happen. But let me tell you why that won't happen. Well, I already said it, it's jealousy. Ministers, pastors are terrible about See, their place is to what? Guard the flock, not strangle them. Guard them. And pastors often strangle the sheep. You know, the scripture says they wouldn't come in, and they wouldn't allow any of the rest of them to come in. I can't tell you how. Uh, 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 one of the brothers from uh, Minneapolis brought me down an article. I, uh, f the first interview I've let be done for me with me for probably 20 years. And I thought, well, it'll help the fellowship up here, the two fellowships. And I'll be doggone, got a pastor involved in here that, that wrote down here about all that I, I had prophesied that didn't come to pass, and I never even prophesied any of it. What is it? It's jealousy. Let me tell you why it's jealousy. They couldn't tell their people, well, yeah, you, that's a prophet. You need to go, you need to go get into this Ephraimite movement. You know why? Because that's what feeds him and his family. And, and, and if that happens, you bring your tithes and your offerings, set them at the feet of this prophet. Well, where would he be? Listen to me, folks. I'm telling you the truth about this stuff. But you know, as I've always said on the other side of this coin, we're, we're going to, we're, we're coming. One of these plagues, one of these catastrophes or disasters is going to get to be so great that when they start going into these church buildings and these preachers can't do nothing for them, then there is going to be, bless God, a mass exodus out of the churches. 
people are going to finally wake up and understand there's got to be more than a sanctuary. God's got to be more than four, five, twenty thousand people. He's the Lord our God. He is what? One God. So when, when we begin to, 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 to realize, now, to bring the, you know, after we, we, we have to bring what? We have to exalt, which, uh, bless God, that the emanation and every high thing that will exalt itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into every uh, captivity every thought to the obedience of God. Does anybody, uh, if you never, how, are you beginning to get the idea this is going to take work? How many wrong thoughts do you have in a day's time? Well, I don't have any. I've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. I'm sorry. You've been cleansed for eternal life by his blood, but it doesn't have nothing to do with your thoughts. Now, you, now, let me tell you how you do this if you've got a problem with this. The first thing that's a plan, like I said, I, I, you don't have to scream and carry on like I do. I, I'm a little eccentric. I know you don't couldn't tell, right? Somehow I got my favorite coffee co cup broke last quarterly, and I mentioned no names, of course. And well, I'm, I've had you know I've, I've had I've had a pretty tough time, folks. I mean, trying to find a comfortable coffee cup. Said, oh, you don't. Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> Said, I expected that. Like, I expected you to be that. Oh, yeah, that's me. But begin to write down your thoughts. Every time you have a wrong thought, and, and you can get these little, they used to, now I guess they still make them. They're just little, little spiral things about like that, and they fold over. That won't be enough, but, you know, it would be a good start. <laughs> Some of you fill that up real quick, okay? But every time you get a wrong thought, and, and how do you start out with? You start out the morning by saying, Lord God. You should ever start the day out with repentance. You should end the day with repentance. In the middle of the afternoon, if you can pray, you begin that with repentance. And then you say, Father, Lord God, unction me every thought that I have that's contrary to your promises, contrary to your word that I might be able to get them out of my mind. I'm going to tell you what, that is the beginning of deliverance. Well, yeah, but I'd rather come up there and you just lay hands on me and say, Come out in the name of Yeshua! I've already told you that ain't going to happen this weekend. Not unless you're here and you've got a, uh, one of the six, seven, eight, ten, whatever I wrote down. And if you're carrying those, you'll be coming up here and I will drive those out of you. But not, not these. These these are devils. These are spirits of darkness, demons, all one and the same. But like I said last night, there's obviously different levels of them. I've seen some put on shows. I've seen them that have attacked people. Uh, bless God, uh, you know, all kind of things. But if you'll begin to write it down, then you'll become become begin to become conscious. And every time after that, that, that one of those thoughts comes into your noggin, your mind, you're automatically going to say, oh, wait, did that one yesterday. No, I won't receive that. What, what kind of thoughts are we talking about? Well, Joe, the next door neighbor, he let the dog come over and you be in my yard again. Man, I would like to take that. Huh? <laughs> Wrong thought. Every thought unto the obedience of God. Every thought. Well, I'm going to tell you what now. I, I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> I, you know, it's all right. It's all right to have have holy anger against old old Billy Billy Joe over here. No, it's not. No, no, that's no. Vengeance are mine, saith the Lord. God will take care of you if, in fact, you will let Him take care of you. He can't take care of you. Now listen, as long as you're taking care of yourself, through, I'm just going to go tell that old gal, the next time she bakes me one of those cakes, don't bother giving it to me. It's that bad. Wrong thought. Well, you know, I got, I, I got my car up for sale. <laughs> I sold it. Man, I only had 4000 in it. I got eight out of it. Every thought. Be kind, loving one another, forgiving one another, not taking one another, one another to the to the doggone uh, the end of whatever it is because you got. Now listen, 
Greedy, that's a spirit. Some of you here today have a spirit of greed. Some of you don't. Folks, there, there is a rhyme and a reason for all this, okay? And maybe within the next year or two, I can point back and say, do you remember when? Now you can understand why we're here and why God's demanding this of you now. But in order for us to get you to that, that point, I've got to now bring you from this point from the other points in which we've had for three and a half years. And, and I'm going to say this. Most of you are doing real well. Most of you, I think, is right on schedule. There's a few stinkers amongst us, okay? But uh, God's got a way, okay? And what you need to do now is to understand, because, you know, I told you, it, it, this, is going, this isn't going to be easy. If this was easy, folks, everybody would be doing it. It's not easy. It is going to change your life. It's going to make you Christ-like. And then people that don't like you is going to be able to more than tolerate you. Well, it's not my fault. Oh, yeah, it is. Our personalities clash. Wrong thought. The problem is you. When you look into that mirror, that Holy Ghost mirror, and see yourself, when you can say, I'm the problem. I've got to fix it. You're on your road. You're, you're, you're on your road to a beginning of delivering yourself from these things of darkness. Now, Genesis, the third chapter of the Genesis. Now, uh, remember, we, 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 we're talking about pulling down the imaginations, the things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of the Most High God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Christ. 